Okay. Thank you for coming, class. We are past the midway, midway point with the semester. We're up to week nine. We currently have 15 weeks. So that would mean that this week included, we have a total of uh, all the way from, from week 10 to week 15. What we have left to do now besides the SimNet assignments, um, if you haven't already registered for SimNet, please register for SimNet. I will actually send out the, I'll resend out the links. That's also part of your uh, curriculum material as well, which is sort of connect. But right now we have the midterms going on. Usually the midterms are um, one week, but I'm giving you guys two weeks to complete the midterm. So you have until March 31st. Right now it's the 28th. So you have to the end of this week to complete your midterms. Now hold on one second there. So you have until um, this, the end of this week, we mentioned because midterms technically started last week. So you had last week and you have to the end of this week. Midterms are 25% uh, of your grade. So it's a pretty, pretty big chunk of your grade. Please make sure you complete it before the end of this week. If you had a problem during your midterm, so if you were taking your midterms and your computer died out, uh, or something of that sort, just email me and I can reset the midterm so you could uh, complete it properly because sometimes we have computer issues during those exams and it'll help, uh, uh, it, it helps if you let me know, I can correct the issue. Uh, without further ado, we'll get into the, the classwork. Um, I took the side note I took the, the instructions on how to complete and begin your, your uh, the project. You'll see the project video at the top of your announcements. So that has begun already uh, two weeks ago. You have the company project, which you should be working on. Uh, in week eight, you'll see the instructions on how to do the company project. And I posted a video on how to complete company project, where to find the answers. You just have to pick and choose a company. So I am going to also send a, a reminder announcement to kind of remind the class, what are your assignments? What do you need to do? What you should be doing up to this point and what you should have completed. But please make sure you finish the, the midterm by the end of this week. If you had a problem with the midterm, you timed out, you didn't complete it, send me an email, let me know. Uh, my, my email is on the Blackboard uh, under the faculty information. You can find, send me an email. Okay, so this week, is more under the management section of what we were going over prior. This one's going over motivation of employees. And I'll try to keep this uh, fairly quick for you guys. Uh, having employees is, is one thing. Motivating employees and getting them to do their required tasks is a whole other issue. And this goes over a sort of management theory on your on motivating employees. And that's what this chapter is. As far as your exams are concerned, this is purely about theory, right? So Taylor's theory, uh, theory X, theory Y, theory Z, Herzberg theory, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Those are sort of the test questions you would see on your exam, your final exam now, because this is all this materials post midterm. And just understanding and knowing those uh, definitions is, is really, the key to, to passing your exam and, and doing well on it. So the value of motivation is from the employer standpoint is getting your employee to do the thing that you need them to do because if they don't do the work, 
that you're requiring to do, then your employee, you, you, you know, you're paying them to do what exactly? So the more motivated the employee is, the more um, engaged they are, the more likely to follow instructions, uh, complete their tasks, so on and so forth. Kind of like me teaching a class. There's eight students participating right now in the Zoom lecture. But when I first uh, registered this course, there's over 25 students registered for this course. So we got 25 students registered in this course. Only eight of them are in the Zoom lecture. So motivation is, is a part of it as to why there's such low engagement. But this is pretty common uh, in the intro courses. Students are coming from high school. This is their first course. They're just starting, they're just starting high school or college. Um, it's sort of getting out of that high school mentality and getting into sort of a mentality that you need to have in the workplace and you sort of see the separation. So would these motivational characteristics apply that you're learning here on a campus with students? And the question is, it depends. So I want to get into some of those uh, motivational techniques, which are listed here. So the first thing is understand reward structures, intrinsic and extrinsic reward, uh, extrinsic rewards. Intrinsic is something that makes you feel better about you, your self-accomplishment. Like someone gets an A on, a, on an exam or a paper because it makes them feel good. They like to feel good about what they do. Extrinsic would be, I don't know, giving students a pizza party, giving them some sort of physical reward, uh, something of that sort. So some people are motivated more so intrinsically, some more extrinsically, it depends on the individual, sometimes both. So Frederick Taylor, the father of scientific management, sort of went into the science of understanding management. And the three key elements for him is you're looking to sort of the time methods of work and rules of work. So you're breaking that relationship ship up between the employee and the manager and seeing how those categories apply to the elements of productivity. So he did, he did different studies uh, on tasks because you have to understand that back in the day, you had tasks that were more manual labor because you didn't have the level of automation that you had today. People are sitting in front of their computers, right? We're sitting here in front of our computers. This is work. You, know, you sit here and do work from your computer. You didn't have this type of technology back when Frederick Taylor was analyzing scientific management. And it's important to understand because when he was looking at time motion studies, he was looking at labor that people did manual labor, right? Maybe you're building something with your hands or creating something with your hands or creating something manually. And he looked at the, the time to complete the task, how quick you are completing the task. It's different now. You can go, you can download chat GPT and you can write books. Literally there's people, a little scam people too. It's still scummy, but uh, people will write, will, will use chat GPT to write books. And then they'll try to sell those books on Amazon, <laughs> which is crazy. Uh, obviously, students are using ChatGPT to, to complete their, their assignments. Uh, you could use ChatGPT to write you a, a resume. You know, uh, ChatGPT, write me an outline for a resume and it'll write a whole outline. It's helpful. Uh, AI completely changes the, the totally changes the nature of, of, of management and, and motivation and just the, the value of how you would sort of look at motivating employees, managing employees is completely different now, right? This whole time motion study, it, it, it's not even really applicable. You, you could automate a lot of even typing things. How quickly are you typing things? Oh, he could type out an email in five minutes. You know, sometimes it's not even about how quick you type. It's literally you have to think and process information, edit things, understand things. It's just, it just doesn't, 
is outdated. Okay, some of this uh, the is not outdated with everything, right? If you're doing a manual labor job, and there's, you know, the, the shirt I'm wearing was probably made in a country somewhere where someone had to hand stitch certain things with manual labor. Manual labor is still a very important part of our economy. In fact, some people like to purchase things that are handmade because it's supposedly qualitative in some regards. Uh, but the shift in technology and AI makes understanding all this stuff very different. It's, it's just not applicable like it used to be. So as far as your exam is concerned, remember what you need to remember, but keep in mind though that uh, it's very different. I mean, could you imagine, you have machines today that could perform very complicated surgeries on your body. In fact, surgeons use uh, 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 robots to do certain um, uh, certain surgeries. They're not sitting there with a scalpel cutting to your brain. They're using la lasers and machines. So think about how technology is going to be 100 years from now. Completely different. You're going to have you got a machine that can look at your head and analyze where to do surgery. You don't even need a surgeon. You know, maybe you need a surgeon there just in case. AI screws up because AI does screw up. It's not perfect. It, it can it can really botch up things, and you know there's flaws in it. Uh, but you know you can have a doctor, have an AI doctor. Seriously, you just sit on a machine. It, this doesn't exist yet, by the way. What I'm telling you doesn't exist yet, but but it can because the technology is technically there. It just no one's created it yet. You can sit on a machine takes your blood work, it analyzes the blood panel, and then it gives you a recommendation, tells you what's wrong. In fact, doctors, when they, when they take your blood work, the, 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 uh, the software analyzes the blood work, and it gives you a range on the panel, you know, high, low, medium. If you have diabetes, a lot of times the, the machine or the, the software will tell you you're diabetic because your, your glucose or whatever measurement is reading is too high or too low or you're pre-diabetic. Doctors, you know, they, look, I've, I've had doctors tell me things. They were wrong. I went to another, I went to an allergist and she said, oh, I'm looking at your blood work and da, da, da. And I said, oh, how come all those other doctors didn't see that? So you have human error. Uh, and a lot of that human error is being removed because machines are able to pick up the slack and do analysis that humans don't see. Your doctor is seeing 30 patients a day. Believe me, you're not going to be on point with all 30 patients. All right. So the reality is that, you know, AI and, and uh, technology could easily overtake some of the basic rudimentary functions of healthcare. You've got healthcare shifting. It's on topic, but it's, it's off topic, but it's on topic. You've got healthcare shifting in such a way where people, uh, uh, insurance companies are trying to lower the cost of, of healthcare because a doctor is a very well-trained, highly specialized individual. They have uh, <laughs> like a, a decade of experience training to be a doctor. And then you come in with a cold or a cough and you need to see a doctor. And that doctor's time is, is worth a lot. The, the fees the insurance company pays for that doctor's services a lot. But you're coming in for something simple that maybe a nurse could have took care of, uh, a, a medical aide or a doctor's aide could have took care of, could have wrote you a prescription for an antibiotic or, or cold medication or, or some flu, something, something simple, Tamiflu. So they're trying to bring down the, the average cost of medicine by making sure doctors are only dealing with higher level issues, more specialized issues, because lower level issues are, are taking up the same level of time from a doctor, but they cost the same per hour. If a, doc, if you, if a doctor's rate is 500 an hour, just making that number up by the way, 500 an hour, if they spend $500 an hour dealing with, with low level issues like uh, cold, flu, you know, stuff like that, you know, that's not a complicated uh, diagnosis. So insurance companies are like, well, what if someone like a nurse took care of that? Because they're 200 an hour 
or 150 an hour, you bring down the cost. And then if someone has something more complicated, more serious, that's when the doctor comes in. So they're like, so there's all these new uh, positions in healthcare. They're like intermediary positions with doctor. They're like doctor, like a, a, a lower level doctor. So they have some doctor training, but not all of it. So that way they could deal with those type of issues uh, to bring down the cost of healthcare. The reality though, is that if you really wanna bring down the cost of healthcare, it's an AI, it's in technology. You, you, you literally could just, you have those machines, you see them in the pharmacy sometimes, you, you, they, it reads your blood pressure, right? You sit there, read your blood pressure. You could literally have a machine that reads your blood pressure. I just saw a machine that, that uh, takes your blood. It's like a little laser. It reads where your vein is. And it, in, I think it's in China. I think I might have saw it. And it was a machine that took your blood. It, it, it was able to inject something in, in, the, in the vein. So you could, <laughs> and you might not even need that. So you could literally sit in the machine or have a nurse take care of it, you know, it, 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 whatever. Take your blood, and then you get back this whole information, a panel, analyzes everything. That's what a doctor's supposed to do. AI could, could analyze your blood work and tell you what all your issues are, and then decide if it wants to take that information and designate it back to the nurse, designate it back to a lower or high level person to deal with based upon the risk factors of that blood work, which could have been done by a machine. Because it because everything could be analyzed at that point, so the whole this whole notion of, of of scientific management is becoming so different because of how technology is changing everything. It, it's kind of outdated, and and revisionary wise, it needs to be changed. So, uh, <laughs> do your best to just memorize it. It does one hundred percent apply to certain aspects of our society, uh, but like everything I'm telling you about with with technology with medicine. It doesn't exist, but it, the technology is here. It's just not made yet. I'm telling you, you know, when I'm an old man, it's, being a doctor is going to be different. It's going to be very different. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy. It's, it's not difficult to think about, especially when you think about uh, blockchain. I don't know if you guys know with blockchain. Blockchain is what cryptocurrency is blockchain. Blockchain is simply nothing more than, than instructional rules uh, that create sort of like a ledger. You can integrate blockchain into AI and, and you could have all these rules and laws that would structure and govern how the AI deals with medicine. You know, like the, the stuff is there. It's honest to God there. I'm sure this, there's some pharmaceutical tech company now creating what I'm saying in the back somewhere and pulling billions of dollars of venture capital to create it. But all the pieces are there. So this is all going to be very different. Unfortunately, it sucks because if you're trained to be a doctor today, uh, you might be out of work. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. If you're trained to be like a nurse or something or, or not a nurse, but if you're training in one of the, the job professions that insurance companies are pushing to bring down the cost of medicine, you're going to be out of work if it's not a direct care job where you actually need to physically take care and handle a client. Because if it's not a direct care job, uh, AI technology could absolutely just sort of overtake what you're doing. Uh, I would say research is probably the one exception. You know, you, you could be a doctor and do research, uh, but it's going to shake it's going to shake everything up. So anyway. Uh, I spent a lot of time on that, but I will. I do want to focus on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is important. So Maslow says that this hierarchy kind of determines the level of importance based upon your needs. This is actually psychology, believe it or not, but it's being applied into uh, business management because a lot of management is the psychology of how people are. So you'll see that business management overlaps very strongly to psychology. So People need basically the bottom first. Your psychological needs need to be taken care of, then your safety needs need to be taken care of. Then you have social needs, you know, socializing, friends, family. And then you go into these higher needs of esteem and self-actualization. So if you want to build on this aspect of someone in a managerial level, 
or over here on a manager level, or over here on a manager level, you need to make sure you're taking care of this basic stuff, right? So if, if your employees are working in an environment where they don't feel safe, their psychological needs are not being met, then you're not going to be able to actually motivate them on these higher levels. So you have to satisfy each need first, the bottom of the highest, and then focus on the next level of, of, of what completes and fulfills a person. So I think this is somewhat important from a managerial standpoint because uh, you've got work conditions in certain countries where <laughs> they are definitely not, not fulfilling some of these needs. So, uh, and, and in fact, actually, especially in China, you've got these uh, suicide nets for certain, certain areas where people try to commit suicide. It's, it's, it can be pretty bad. So uh, that's not to say all of us like that, but, but it's an issue for certain areas. Uh, I feel like if people had their basic needs met, they wouldn't be trying to jump off a bridge or, or uh, trying to commit suicide and kill themselves. And in some cases, it might not be the basic needs that are being met. It might be these higher needs, uh, social needs. Society can be very isolating, you know, very lonely. People don't feel, this is a, especially in the U.S., this is a big deal, esteem needs. People have a lot of issues with being happy with themselves. It's always been an issue. Uh, girls getting uh, filler injections in their lips, in their face. Young men taking uh, uh, testosterone and uh, trend and all these other, uh, getting surgery on their bodies because they're so unhappy with, with their, the way they look and feel because of social media, because of, of uh, peer pressure. But none of it's really, no one's really picking on each other. It's the false perception of the marketing uh, of society that's giving youth this impression that they are not worthy, that they're inferior, that they're too short, that their body isn't attractive enough. You know, and that's, a, that's all esteem, right? Because they're, they're meeting their psychological safety needs. They live at home, they have a family. Uh, but these over here is where you start to see that blur. So you start to see whether Maslow's hierarchy of needs has some relevancy because it plays even in society. And then people are stuck over here, right? So this is functionally important when thinking about your employees. Where are, where are they on this, on this chart? And what are you needing to provide in a workplace so that people uh, feel actualized? and happy, and in this case, motivated. Someone might feel more love in their workplace than their home because of how toxic their household could be. You know, it happens sometimes. People love their friends more than they might love their family because of issues with their family. So anyway, Hertzberg's motivation factors. Hertzberg found job content factors were most important to workers. Workers like to feel they contribute to the company. So this is where people have to feel some value. And this kind of ties back to sort of this self-actualization area of it. Um, motivate, he broke it down to motivators and hygiene factors. So job factors that cause dissatisfaction and missing that do not necessarily motivate employees have increased. So you sort of structuring aspects of motivation such that you can figure out what you want to leverage to increase motivation and what areas, not so much. And, 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 you know, he's going over hygiene factors, things that cause dissatisfaction, but changing them have very little effect on motivation from his observation. And you can kind of tie it back to some of the areas of the hierarchy of needs. But he said that salary has very little impact on motivation. You know, it depends on the person. Uh, if you're not paying me a lot of money, I may not necessarily be motivated to do the job, but there are people that take jobs not because of salary, but because they love doing the job. Social workers, teachers, they do their job because they're motivated because of the work itself, uh, the growth and advancement, the achievement. They don't care about the salary. If you look at an investment banker working for a bank, uh, the salary is a pretty big uh, composition for why they're doing that job. Any job that's kind of soulless and its interactions with others, you're going to see that the hygiene factors sometimes play a bigger role. <clears throat> because why would you work 16 hours a day, seven days a week, 
if it's just for achievement, right? Some people do that because they're making a million dollar salary. And, you know, it puts them in a different social setting. Different so and that people will, I mean, look at the UFC. Look at uh, bare knuckle boxing. I used that example prior class. These people are getting their faces punched in, uh, losing teeth, getting brain damage. You know, uh, for them, it's an opportunity that's better than what they have. You know, some people do bare knuckle boxing because bare knuckle boxing pays better than than UFC. Uh, but it hell, it hell, a lot more dangerous in some in many regards. So salary becomes a factor for why people are even taking those jobs. You have all these, uh, you know, uh, it, it plays a role. It plays a role. But I'm sure there's people that that box because they're into the achievement, the recognition, the responsibility. So I feel like. Uh, a lot of these factors depend on the individual and that individual where they are on this hierarchy of needs really affects how much more or less hygiene or motivator, the hygiene factors and the motivated factors, how much more intrinsically tied they are to their efficacy. So that's why I think the, the hierarchy of needs for Maslow is important because it kind of ties into a lot of things here. But this is important, though. You, you know, depending on your career uh, or or who you're managing, salary may be less of an issue, right? Like if you're managing teachers or uh, social workers, I guarantee you, salary is not what's in, why they're there. You know, someone that's doing therapy for a child, this is important. But these aspects are going to have a much more bigger role in how you manage them. So it is important, regardless. And, and you'll see what I had just said is they're doing this sort of comparison between the two, right? So it's breaking down hygiene and motivation, uh, but it's more of an individual level with the person because someone, the individual is going to play a big role in terms of, of where motivation plays for them. So the XY theory a theory X is pretty much summarized here. Workers just like work and seek to avoid it. Da, da, da. Theory Y, people like work as part of life. Da, da, da. And, and uh, Z, William Ochi, uh, took a hybrid approach between types A and J, which he used the US is type A, Japan type J. And he explains what those are. And what this is just saying is culture plays a big role in motivation. Culture plays a big role in shaping motivation, shaping psychology. You know, like literally it comes back here. You could be living in a country where safety is not an issue. Your psychological and safety needs are met because your country is a first world country. You could be living in a country where, where these are issues. These are big issues. And it's going to deeply change your motivation for what you do and what you don't do. Uh, and the culture can shape that. So uh, there's there's a lot of cultural bias in the the analysis of these theories that uh, is often neglected. But it is brought to light here in this example of sort of the Japanese and American because of the manufacturing Japan and so on and so forth being a superpower. So these are different theories. This would be like a good test, like you want to study for a test, theory X, theory Y, theory Z. It's comparisons right here, okay? Goal setting theory, the idea that, that ambition and attainable goals can motivate workers and improve performance goals if they are accepted, accompanied by feedback, facilitated by organizational conditions. I would say this is true. The, you know, a lot of these theories are sometimes almost sort of common sense, but you can look at your management structure and see if this is really applying to how you're managing employees. Uh, I kind of want to jump forward a bit. So uh, this is just sort of going over a generational aspect of it. You know, what's going to motivate a Gen Z or a millennial is not the same as a baby boomer and a Gen X. So this is where the sociality, the, the sociality of it and the culture really plays a big role in motivation. So we have about a minute left. So what I want to say to the class just briefly uh, is to please make sure you complete your midterms before the end of this week. 
Uh, please make sure you, you, you reviewed your connect assignments, uh, complete your discussion board assignments. I would say once you finish this midterm, then you can really start digging into uh, your project, which is the company research project. I'll send out a reminder to everyone to sort of remind everyone uh, what's on the plate and what you need to do. And uh, take care, everybody, and have a good day.